Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's securityboulevard.com program, brought to you by Textron. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of Textron Learning, and we have an exciting panel for you ahead. First, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded. If you miss any of our discussion, or you'd like to rewatch or maybe share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions for our panelists, we want you to send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which you'll find on the right side of your screen. For any other comment, thought, or maybe you just want to let us know from where you're joining us, uh, we want you to direct those comments to the chat tab. If you check out the handouts, you'll see there are a couple of materials that have been uploaded by Salt Security for your convenience today. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around. Our topic today is API security, and I'm joined by Michelle McLean, Vice President of Marketing at Salt Security, Brett Settle, Co-Founder and Chief Strategy Officer at ThreadX, Scott Gerlach, co-founder and chief security officer at Stackhawk. And moderating today's program, we do have Mike Vazard, chief content officer here at Textron Group. So to our panel, thank you so much for joining us. Mike, you wanna take it away from here? All right, thanks, Cody, great. Welcome everybody. I kinda of wanna get started with uh, some sense of where we are with API security, why we're talking about this today. Now I'm gonna throw this first question towards Michelle, but. I almost feel like API security doesn't get enough respect. There isn't enough people talking about it. Application security for that matter is often viewed as perhaps the redheaded stepchild of security in the first place. What is the current uh, issue with API security and why isn't there more focus on it? Yeah, I think there's a few dynamics at play, Mike, uh, and, and happy to be here today and happy to be with these panelists uh, alongside. Uh, I think that there's always a bit of a gap, right? Security always lags the infrastructure change. It's a question of, you know, by how much. Uh, now, APIs are an interesting case because they've been around for a long time. And I think to some extent that familiarity has bred some complacency. And I think people think, well, we, you know, we solved that a long time ago or it's not that hard to do. Um, but I think there's a third dynamic, which is especially tough right now in this market, which is confusion. Uh, some of it a little bit, I would say, intentional, because this is a market where I think people are really realizing how crucial this is, right? APIs are the building blocks of all our applications today. Uh, some people have even proposed we should be flipping it, and application security should be a subset of API security, not the other way around, because you'll have APIs that'll connect services with no front end, and there won't be an app, per se, but you'll still need to secure those pipes. And I, I think against that backdrop, what we've seen is you have you, you have companies in sort of adjacent markets or part of the ecosystem. And API security, I think, is getting a decent amount of attention. It's certainly getting a lot of venture attention. And it's there have been some pretty astounding headlines around API-centric attacks that have led to really significant data exfiltration. And so I think you see a bit of a pile on effect, right? You see people in adjacent markets saying, well, we do that too. Or you see people in, in nearby markets sort of pivoting and saying, well, that's us now. Uh, we're going to, we're going to wear that hat. Um, and I think that it creates confusion around really what constitutes API security, what it needs to look like, what it needs to comprise and what good looks like. And I think we'll have a, a good discussion on that front today. Mm. Scott, if you don't mind, would you level set for us? Not everybody attending here is an API security expert. Um, what is the current state of the art for securing APIs? What makes it difficult for that matter? I mean, I'm assuming it's difficult because if it wasn't, more people would be doing it, right? So what exactly is involved? Sure. Thanks for having me, Mike. Happy to be here. Um, you know, like Michelle said, <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion out in the market about API security uh, intentionally because why not have new marketing words? But uh, similar to what happened with cloud, right? That was a thing that people knew about. And then someone went, let's call it cloud. And it turned into a whole thing. So in API security land, you know, APIs are applications. It's right there in the name. So when we're talking about application security, we're talking about APIs and front end apps and traditional server side rendered apps. All of these things 
our applications. And then now I got a thing that just popped up. Mike said, put away all your stuff. And then I got a thing. <clears throat> My bad. Okay. So <laughs> when we're talking about application security, we got to talk about testing and operating, right? We're talking about the same OODA loop that is in uh, DevOps and regular application development and delivery. And all of those things include testing and operation. So testing to make sure you're not in introducing new application security vulnerabilities while you're building, writing, and compiling code, and then monitoring and protecting those things in production as they operate throughout their life cycle. So, you know, you've got API testing, API building, API protection, API monitoring. Those are all part of API security. Uh, and everyone even here does a little part of that, right? And there's no there's no thin slice that you can just kind of go, we got to do this one and that'll uh, obviate the need for the other ones. You got to kind of take the life cycle of an API and talk about how do I securely build? How do I monitor and operate this stuff? All right. Brett, let's jump in the, with you for a minute. Part of the issue I think is there isn't enough noise around API security because people aren't sure if their APIs have been compromised or attacked. I mean, you know, are bad guys finding these APIs or is this a case where we're waiting to see an attack come and then everybody will uh, wake up and say, oh my God, we got to go fix this tomorrow. Where are we in this level of threat? Yeah, I, well, I think um, as Michelle said, I mean, there have been some pretty high profile breaches recently and attributed to the API front. So I think the noise is starting to get out there. It's starting to, the awareness and the visibility is starting to get out there. But from a, you know, from a practicality perspective, the challenge I think with APIs has always been, how do you actually monitor and detect what's, you know, truly bad behavior? And how do you distinguish whether there's a real attack going on or not? And again, some of that is because APIs, they serve multiple clients. They can be utilized in a lot of different ways. And so building the profiles to understand whether that's normal behavior or not normal behavior can become very difficult. And I think you know, what we've seen is, uh, I think it was uh, two quarters ago, we saw about a 278% increase in the attacks going on for the APIs uh, themselves. As you may or may not know, we, we you know, protect both web applications as well as the APIs. And we saw a distinctive switch in terms of folks that where they would once attack maybe the authorization components of a web application. Once they identified through discovery, that there were backend APIs that were forming the authentication, we saw the, a super increase in the amount of both discovery activity and then when and where they thought they found a potential vulnerability, we would see them really scale up those attacks, oftentimes at bot levels, where we were seeing not just you know a few hundred or a few thousand attacks, but literally hundreds of thousands of attacks. And that was whether it was something for an account takeover type of attack or especially for the financial institutions that had credential stuffing attacks and things of that nature. So long story short is, yeah, I think it, if it was a secret at any point in time, it's certainly not a secret anymore. And I think and we, when we look at the attacks that we're seeing in live uh, real production right now, the scale and the number of them is increasing you know, exponentially as we move forward. Michelle, I know you guys have published a couple of reports in the same regard. Are you seeing the same yeah. thing? Yeah, really, really dramatic increases. Um, and, you know, most recently, I think the latest uh, survey data was about 117 percent increase. Um, the, you know, the range of companies that are feeling this, it's really, really broad brushstrokes. And the other interesting thing is we do a survey that combines sentiment data from survey results and then empirical data from the SALT um, SAS cloud. And within that, we have more than a third of SALT customers enduring more than 100 attacks every month. That's really substantial. Um, some of them, it's very acute, as, as Brett indicated. I think the credential stuffing is probably a great example of that. We have a customer, Finastra, that has talked about this, like what have they needed to do to protect against this because the humans can't keep up, like full stop. It's just not possible. And I think another thing implicit in what Brett talked about that I think is worth shining a light on is you know this doesn't always happen with security um, or, or with the attacks themselves. Often what you have is you have a change in, in the application construct. You move to cloud, you adopt cloud native with containers and Kube. 
you are building in some new way. And so the attack surface changes and you begin to get your head around how the attack surface changes. But typically the attacks themselves haven't changed historically. You're trying the same old stuff. It's just that you've got new ways in because of this change in the attack surface. But actually with APIs, Brett makes, makes a good point. They figure out what's going on with APIs to start to learn your APIs. They actually attack differently. And I think it's really important for people to get their heads around that. The nature of the attack is different. And I would say that there's good news and bad news that comes with it. The, the bad news is because it's so different, the volume that it's happening at, the, the fact that they will actually very intentionally slow roll things, the fact that they need to do so much recon to even figure out how to start attacking a given set of APIs. The bad news about that is it can fly under the radar, right? Your existing stuff, your WAFs, for example, your gateways, for example, they're really looking one transaction at a time. And API attacks are not done in a single transaction at all. It takes dozens of interactions to understand the API and then to begin to try to probe, okay, well, what if, what if you get the Experian example? What if I put all zeros in for a birth date, right? That wasn't the first thing that guy did. It was like the 39th thing that guy did. So that low and slow, there's an upside and a downside. The downside is your current stack can't see it. The upside is you've got time. Uh, we're used to really freaking out in security, right? If one thing happened, if they did one thing, then that was a breach. They got in. I'm owned, right? And that's not the case with API security. It's you've got time. They they might even have minor level successes where they're working their way to building more and more information, but they didn't reach their ultimate objective. They didn't get the data exfiltration. They didn't get the account takeover. So, you know, there's a blessing and a curse to this change dynamic, but you've got to understand the methodology because that's how you're going to understand what protections are going to work. Brent, is it your sense that these are the same attackers acquiring new skills or are there new attackers out there that are coming to bear who have higher levels of skills than we've seen in the past where, you know, people who are attacking network firewalls, it's hard to think about them necessarily, you know, becoming developer centric. So are the bad guys adding new skills with new people or do you think that they're just up level in their game because it's gotten too hard to do other things? Uh, well, actually, it's probably both, which is the ubiquitous answer here. But I mean, I, I think Michelle may be hit it on the head a little bit. They can do a lot more without being discovered um, on the API side. And, you know, partially, I think the number one question probably all of us on the, on the vendor side get from customers is they don't always even know how many APIs they have, first and foremost. But once they, you know, even if they have a good feel for the APIs, it's understanding the utilization of those APIs and the fact that they can have multiple clients. So you may see different patterns of behavior coming through, but how do you monitor for those patterns of behavior? How do you monitor for different uh, potential discovery techniques? And then how do you best understand, you know, when and if they are truly moving into the exploitation phase? So I think your question was, is it the same old group of guys doing what they were doing before? Well, to a certain extent, yes because they've realized now that they have a very vulnerable area, so to speak, in which they can really focus on these APIs and last a lot longer before they start burning out those IPs. At the same time, they're also understanding that because of the nature of APIs and the reuse, that there are more vulnerabilities for them to look for and to exploit that maybe weren't quite as available um, you know, from an application or a web or mobile component. So I, I do see that. And then I think, you know, uh, the, the next kind of last flavor for this piece would just be, yeah, we absolutely are seeing folks that are starting to transition and run these multi-step attacks. And I think that's what Michelle was talking about. It's, it's not a fire and forget and hopefully get the payload, but it's a, if I use the combination of this technique, plus, you know, the results from this technique, plus the results from this technique, then I can get a much more uh, valuable payload out of this, uh, out of the particular application. And it's, it's picking up on all those different pieces of, of context and putting the picture together in order to really understand what's happening. All right, Scott, the world is supposed to be shifting left. It's gonna solve all our security issues. We're gonna have DevSecOps and wouldn't API security be a subset of DevSecOps? I mean, how should people think about that? 100%. <laughs> you know, we talk about, uh, we don't know what applications are out there. Guess who knows what applications are out there? The engineering team. 
Mm-hmm. We're we're out here pretending like devs or DevOps didn't happen, and there's still a central operating center you send all the alerts to, and they escalate to people. Like we're not doing a good job as a security industry of empowering developers to be able to understand what's happening here and why it could be bad and give them quick feedback loops on, Hey, here's something that's going on. That doesn't look normal. It looks anomalous. Also, here's how that could lead to, you know, an attack, whether it's uh, get an object ID and then you reuse that object ID. That's not, that's not necessarily new in API land, the part of it that's new is that security teams are unprepared for all this stuff, right? Development teams have been working on APIs for years. They know how APIs work generally. They know most of the security protection mechanisms that go into APIs. It doesn't mean they still can't make mistakes. What they're, what they're missing is that observability in the security context to be able to go, oh, I see what's happening to my API and I see why that could be bad. I should go recheck that code, retest that code. And it, you're absolutely right. It's part of DevSecOps. But as security folks, we got to get ourselves out of this out of this idea that we're our own department. Because that's what's really screwing this up is like not integrating with operations, development, operations, DevOps teams, and kind of being this separate entity that is the only one that has access to the tool and the only one that can understand what's happening. And that's really, really slowing down our progress against people that are attacking these APIs. Michelle, who should be in charge of all of this stuff as we go forward? And I asked yeah. because to Scott's point, that's all well and fine. But last time I checked, you know, security was an elective for most developers and still don't know anything. <laughs> so who should be running this thing? Yeah, I think there's the world we wish we had and the world we really do have. And I think there's just some amount of um, reality that just bears bears here. So I think it, it, it is attractive to say developers write APIs, therefore developers should secure APIs. I think that that belies two things, uh, two truths. One, where are developers focused? They're focused on moving fast. They're focused on building innovation. They're focused on propelling the industry, their, sorry, their company faster with innovation, right? They are the the holders of, you know, customer delight and customer experience and, and all of that. And that's their clear mandate. And I think that that's appropriate. Should they be have more education? Should security sit with DevOps and, and, and be those security champions internally to bring security into the conversation? 100%. At the end of the day, do they really think like attackers? Do they want security to be be such a guiding principle that they will slow down innovation to get it right? Probably not. And at the end of the day, as much as we might not want security to be a separate department, there's usually some entity that's on the hook when when, when, when something hits the fan, right? And it's not developers. Uh, And so I think with this push towards shift left, which is good and noble and should happen, I think we just have to take it as a measured thing. There's only so far it's going to get you. There's only so far that pre-prod testing is going to get you with API security anyway, because at the end of the day, it's a business logic attack and you have to see the code exercised to understand that and prevent that. Uh, You can do some attack simulation for sure. And I think that that should be in the mix, Um, but it's only going to get you so far. So it's got limited overall value. And let's be aware, it's down the road value. It's not get, get safe now. It's all your new assets will be written better. So you have to protect what's running now. So I think that there's just a reality of where do you extract the greatest amount of value in the fastest amount of time? That's with runtime security. You should absolutely do shift left. You should 100% educate, you know, make sure your your developers understand what's going on with OWASP API top 10. That's a great starting point. It's not the whole answer, but it's a starting point. And you should harden future APIs. Um, But I, I just think reality bears out. I mean, we we go into customers, we, we have different places we can pop into the network and not in line and just see what's going on, right? And time and time again, it's anywhere from 40% more APIs that, that than they realized they had up to, I think our worst example was 800%. They had 800% more APIs than they realized. Yeah. Now, is that, a, is that a place with great hygiene and documentation? No. 
would you ever want to 100% rely on your developers for security? That's that's tough, right? If it's your ass on the line and you know they've got a backlog of vulnerabilities they haven't gotten to, why are they going to get to your set of vulnerabilities that you've discovered uh, and, and make that the top of their list? I just well, think it's like, tough. Yeah. To, you know, and I would only add, I mean, I think it was a great explanation actually from both of the panelists, but I mean, most of the large organizations, it's a pretty heterogeneous environment. Um, they may have a really strong tier one team that's fully capable of managing, uh, you know, the security issues and hopefully prioritizing them. But I mean, so many of the customers that we run into, it's it's a very large organization and they've got legacy applications that were written five years ago. And yes, APIs were around five years ago um, and they've got, you know, other third parties that they've integrated. So it just it becomes a very complex problem very quickly when you just look at all the different technologies that are kind of brought to bear to deliver you know, the, the full application environment as well. Scott, do you think that there's more of a life cycle thought process here where instead of maybe shifting left or leaning right, it's more about we're going to have a shift left, we're going to lean a little bit left, and then we're going to push right and kind of have this whole spectrum of things. Yeah, I, I, somewhere in the middle, right? You, 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 If we listen to the one of the RSA keynotes that we had this year, the the headcount operation of a development to a DevOps to a security person is 110 to one. It is impossible for a security team to keep up with what development teams are doing because they're outmanned, outpersoned 100 to one. Impossible. You have to be able to shift some of this information and as much of it as you can to the development organization. Now, Michelle said the security team's on the hook for security problems. I disagree with that because the company's on the hook and the company is comprised of development and operations and security teams and executives and all kinds of people. The company's on the hook, not the security team. So if you can't figure out how to collaborate, especially in application security, because it's, it's literally the hardest one to do as a security team. If you're operating security team, there is so much you can do in isolation. You can ingest logs. You can look at all this. You can do that. In application security, you have to have amazing relationships with development teams. And you can't do that by sending them PDFs of problems. You can't do that by not sitting there trying to help them solve the problems that they and the business are also trying to solve. So it, you know, it's somewhere in the middle. Like I said, you have to be able to monitor and operate everything, all the software that you push out there. But you can, you have to be able to do some testing as well. And testing security should work just like every other kind of security or every other kind of testing. You don't go, I'm not going to do any unit tests. I'm going to put it in production and we'll figure out what's broken out there. You don't do that. Why are we doing that with security? Like there's a whole life cycle that has to happen here to be able to test and make sure you're not putting crazy, uh, crazy insecure things into production and then also monitor and operate in production. But the monitor and operate in production thing can't be isolated. You have to work with those engineering teams so they understand what's happening. So they understand the threat that's happening against their against the applications they're developing so that they can develop and make those better over time. Mm -hmm. Michelle, do we need to find some way to maybe, I get Scott's point about the 100 to 1, but... yeah. At some point, the security people have to have a meaningful conversation with the API developers. And it seems like one of the things that happens is that the API developer sits there and says, well, my use case is internally focused right. and therefore I don't have to worry about the security. Oh, good. <laughs> right. But then six months later, somebody says, wow, there's an awesome API there's here that we should share. Put it out there. We should, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> exactly. We're good. We decided to embark on this new activity with this partner. Oh, look, we already have an API that does it. Perfect. Just point it that way. Yeah, that happens uh, a lot. Uh, the the magically internal, safe, protected, never going to see the light of day API is all of a sudden uh, externally focused. Absolutely happens. And um, understanding that those usage patterns have changed. You know, Brett alluded to the need for you know, implicit in what he was saying is that you need some sort of baseline and then recognizing when different happens and then monitoring that different to say, is it that something's changed? Is it that there's a bad guy taking action here? You have to distinguish those those things. But that is a, a very unfortunate reality. And in fact, I was just having some conversations with um, a couple of CISOs in 
financial organizations, and they're under such enormous pressures, particularly in certain parts of the world, to get going fast with open banking. Um, that's been a classic one. They have a lot of stuff that where they're where they're trying to repurpose and fit this new mandate and fit this new use case, and it's changing their whole environment in ways that they don't fully understand. And that's why I think that notion of the continuous understanding of what's going on, continuous protection of all the running APIs is so crucial because you can design perfection, but that will change in reality. That will change in operation. Uh, and, and to Scott's point about giving developers useful information, we think that's really crucial. You got to package that up in a way that's very actionable, very clear what needs to happen from a remediation standpoint to harden that API and see where it's been exploited. Like, how do you rank, right? You got binders of vulnerabilities. Which one's going to come first? Well, the one that's actually gotten exploited should probably come first. Right. And then delivering that information in the pane of glass they're already living in. They're not going to sit in the security platform. So that insight, that crisp definition of what needs to change needs to come down to them in the panes of glass they're already living in. So I think all of those things are important. And I think that this notion that it's a shifting world and you designed one way, but it's getting used another, I think we're all going to be confronting that. And you need security yeah. tools that can help you. The fact that Developers are outnumbered 101, 100 to one. Uh, security is outnumbered 100 to one by developers. Just speaks to the need for this kind of automation and and tooling, so that something's got your back because you'll never keep up manually, and and it would be ridiculous to ask that. So totally dynamic environment. You know, one of the th questions we ask in the state of API security survey is how frequently do your APIs change? Forty percent are reporting the change daily or weekly. That's huge. So, you know, never mind the business makes some decision and changes the use case. Developers are changing them all the time. Are they keeping their documentation up to date? Hmm, probably not. So you, you need something watching for that and, and keeping you safe. All right. So Brett, do we need to assume the worst case scenario for APIs and build policies accordingly from the beginning because there is this guy named Murphy and whatever goes wrong will go wrong, as they say. But how do you have that conversation with the development teams who are always kind of like, I'm a day late and a, and a dollar short on my delivery schedule? Well, I think you, you combine, you know, a little bit of what both Scott and, and Michelle were saying, you know, it's, it's how do you understand what's being targeted in terms of those APIs? Because the reality is even if it is 100 to 1, there's still more things that developers have to get done in a day than they can get done as it is. And not all those things are gonna be security related. So I think Michelle you know, was, was leaning in there to the fact that you wanna show them, these are the particular APIs that are being targeted. These are the endpoints that are being targeted. These are the vulnerabilities that it, it appears exist and should be addressed. And if you're gonna focus on anything, these should be the ones that you focus on first, because these are the ones that actually have the both the highest level of risk in terms of exploitation, but also in terms of just the fact that it's clear someone on the outside knows. It's clear someone on the outside has, has found something of interest that they're zeroing in on, that they're targeting, and it's something that, you know, it would be the first thing to be addressed, uh, even from a development perspective. The other piece I think that goes with that is, even if the, the vulnerabilities are going to be addressed, they can't be turned around immediately. And in some cases, it will take a, a certain amount of time to perform the development, to go through what other, whatever testing is required or other manipulation is required before you can roll that out. So having you know a solution that can put in a virtual patch and be able to provide some level of protection while those changes are being made. And even the log4j that I think we all kind of went through um, not so long ago, great example of just you know the first kind of rearing of its head of that particular exploit, the variations that were coming through and then the scrambling that went on. And there's still customers out there today that are trying to fully protect themselves against all the different variations are there. Having a solution that can really help you understand where do you need to go focus on making the changes, but also be able to provide a level or a measure of protection in the interim, even if it's not 100%, it's enough to be able to provide better protection. I think that's that's really the complete answer. And, and the answer is we need both uh, by all means here. So. All right. Scott, what are some, we have a question from the audience who wants to know, like, what are the real risks of the API? Like, delving deeper into it, what are some of the hacks that people should be looking out for? And what have you seen? And what sure. are you guys thinking? 
I'm sure these two have much more information about specific hacks. But if you think about an API as backing, uh, taking a uh, legacy server-side application, taking the business logic out of it and putting it into a, a specific programming interface that you can interact with in JSON format or uh, some other standardized format, you've got an API. So anything you used to be able to do that's business logic oriented in a uh, old school legacy application uh, now exists in the API. Very few of those things actually exist in the front end, um, whether that's in Ajax form or some other form. Very few, some of them do. Very few actually exist in that front end. So you're talking about being able to access other customers' data. So customer A can get to customer B's data. Uh, being able to access functions that are in um, that are privileged. So being able to, as a user, being able to access admin functions. These are all OWASP API top 10 type things. Rate limiting, um, credential stuffing is my favorite, uh, but also my least favorite thing in the whole world. Because how do you how do you denial of service a API? You credential stuff it, trying to figure out if someone's reused passwords. And that's where rate limiting and all kinds of good stuff come in. So, the, I mean, all of the things that used to exist in an application that you could attack exist in an API. <clears throat> Yeah, but there's some differences too that really matter. Like um, if something's doing credential stuffing in a really classic way, a blunt instrument's gonna see that and be able to, to, to take notice and, and shut that down. What you need to zero in on to get deeper into the actual risks of APIs is the more subtle ones. If you think about something like Ebola, broken object level authentication authorization, and this, by most estimates, this represents about 35 to 40% of, of most API attacks out there. So it's a really good one to understand. And there's a couple of different examples. There's a single parameter BOLA, which is really, really hard to pick up, or double parameter BOLA. So in a double parameter BOLA, for example, you, you ask, like, what are the real risks? So the real risk is I, I have an authenticated, there's an authenticated endpoint, and I have an authenticated session, and I have authorization to a, a, ask about accounts A, B, and C, for example. So I submit in the API request with one user ID and I have access to certain accounts with that user ID. But in a subsequent piece of that request, for instance, the cookie, maybe it's um, the, the token I use the, the user ID that I authenticated with, but in the cookie where I'm making the request to the back end, I enumerate that user ID and put in another one and it's valid. It's a valid format and a valid account. And as a single transaction, that is not going to flag as a security alert to something like a WAF that's just not going to see it because it fits the format. It's the right number of characters. It's the right um, uh, alphanumeric combination, for example. But now I'm getting back the information of that second user ID. It, even more sneaky, so that's a double parameter where I'm manipulating the second parameter within that request. Even more sneaky is a single parameter, BOLA, where I make a request and over time, I just use a different user ID or request on a different account, but, but there's not even two parameters in the same API request. There's just a single one that I'm asking for and I get back that account on information. Then you really need rich context over time to say, this is not what has been typical against this API call. This is a different account that's being used and they're requesting that information back. So if you want to get deeper into how do API attacks get propagated, what are the manipulations that, um, that the bad actors are gonna do? Again, the OWASP API top 10 is a really good starting point. And some of them, you know, well, rate limiting, the volumetric stuff, that's gonna echo back to the standard OWASP top 10. But the first handful in particular, because they go in ascending order, right? They go from the most common attacks to the least in that top 10 list. If you study the first few in detail, look for you know examples of that. We have really detailed information on the SALT blog, open information, no sign in needed. Um, we go into each attack in really great detail and give examples and then give examples from the public world of where that's been exercised. So I think if you really want to understand those differences, that's a great starting point. Brent, have you seen any API attacks that surprised you or are they pretty much all executing the same kind of attacks we've seen elsewhere just through a different mechanism? 
No, I mean, I think what's probably surprised me more than anything, I mean, it's not like I know all the different types of attacks, but I think it's been, it's more of the volume um, that, that we're seeing, especially as it relates to the bot level of attacks that are coming through. And sometimes a noisy attacker is actually easier to spot because obviously it's triggering a lot of, you know, different baseline indicators um, when you're seeing them uh, come through. But I think what we're seeing is the the lower and slower, but maybe spreading the information out um, over a larger number of IPs. And so it's still what I would generally, you know, kind of throw into that bot level of attack. It's got automation. It's got a lot of different IPs, but maybe in the example that Michelle was going through there, you know, we'll see them come through and they're varying, you know, some of the IDs as they're coming through, but they're doing their best to try to mimic um, legitimate users and they're doing their best also to vary enough things that kind of building the context to understand exactly what's going on um they're being very sneaky in the way that they're performing those type of attacks and so as as michelle said you, you kind of need a good baseline of what the normal behavior looks like you need to see enough of the failures that may be coming through or enough of the you know irregular responses that are coming through to start to piece these things together as a multi-step type of attack and I think that's probably the biggest you know, difference that we're seeing. And it's certainly something that I think traditional WAFs or traditional firewall type of solutions that are more binary in nature, they're looking for a specific signature match. It's just impossible to really pick this up because it, it does look like a, a legitimate attack coming through. It's just that, again, it's really being spread out over a much broader attack surface area. And you need a lot more context to really piece together what type of attack you're seeing in front of you here. So. Scott, are we building applications too fast and we need to slow down? Is that possible even? Because it seems like we're just blown by API security issues. Yeah, I, you know, again, uh, the, the job of the engineering team, at a, especially at a tech company, is to generate revenue, generate customers, generate interest. So slow down, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a sustainable or good idea in any form or factor. I think what is a good idea is helping helping development teams understand what mistakes they might be making or have made and giving them the information to be able to correct it as quickly as possible. So tight feedback loops. You know, I, I always coach people, well, if you're out there searching for an application, you're a security person and you're searching for an application security product and you don't bring a dev with you, you're not doing it right. You're not going to have buy-in from the development team. They're not going to be involved in making that feedback loop short, uh, and you're going to be you're going to be doing some shelfware purchasing like you probably did before, and now you're trying to replace. So, um, involving and being involved with engineering teams to understand problems they're trying to solve, what how you can help as a security person. Getting involved in what they're doing is probably the most effective thing that you can do so that you know how to focus your energy and resources and where and what things you can leverage as force multipliers to help get information into development hands as quick as possible. So probably not go slower is the answer. Um, probably go smarter would be my answer. All right. Michelle, we got another question from the audience. They want to know if we're seeing an increase in attacks that are looking for specific organizations, locations, products, or things becoming more targeted, especially in the area of physical infrastructure. Uh, you know, across the cross section of customers that we have, which range from, you know, fintech and finserve to e-commerce and, and crypto and, and things like that, we're not seeing it based on that. Um, what we are seeing is uh, mostly it's data exfiltration still. That's really the objective most of the time. And it's interesting because we'll have conversations with people who will, who will say, you know, I was thinking about this earlier. There was a question about like, how do we learn? Um, how do, you know, where's the starting point? How do we get deeper into understanding API risks? Understanding postmortems, reading postmortems is really, really useful. And actually somebody else in the question panel asked, how do you build ongoing alignment? It's not a, just a one and done at the point of release, but how do you keep the conversation going? I've sat with teams that are reading through postmortems um, and seeing how security contributes to the conversation, how devs 
contribute to the conversation. And that can be a very, very interesting exercise because within that, that, you know, several things will, will come out, you know, oh, you know, the developer's mindset is that they're building for yes. They're building to enable connectivity, right? The developer's trying to let something happen. And the security guy is like thinking of 19,000 ways it can go wrong. They're building for no. And seeing where those can meet and where you can enable everything you need to enable, but a little bit start thinking like a hacker so that you prevent those manipulations as much as possible. That can have real, real power. And um, the other thing that we've noticed, because Salt Labs will do these kinds of postmortems where we will anonymize the the entity involved, but we'll go through a really detailed, like our customers in our in evaluations will ask us to hack them. They'll they'll use our software, they'll do their own pen testing, they'll run attack simulation, but they'll also say, can you just go see if we have bad stuff or we made some mistakes? And we 24, 36 hours, we can usually come back with like, oh, got this going on in this API. And reading through those write-ups. Okay, here's what we did. This is where things often have a weakness. So this is why we looked for this kind of thing on the site. Okay, and we found it here. And then when we did this manipulation, nothing happened. When we did this manipulation, this is what happened. So reading through those, those postmortems can be a real education boon to both sides. Um, and what we found is like, we'll post one of those and then we'll get like five, six different entities writing in saying, Oh my God, we think that that was us. Was that us? Can, will you tell us if that was us? And we're like, no, it, it, it wasn't you. But it just highlights how common these problems are. And they're fairly universal. They're not hard to find. You asked a question earlier about skill set. Uh, Yaniv Balmas, who runs the Salt Lab security research team here at Salt, was giving a talk at Black Hat. And he said, actually, it's easier to hack APIs. I need less knowledge. I don't need like deep kernel knowledge and all this stuff to propagate an attack. It's easier to do an API attack than a lot of other attacks. So I think spending time together and looking through those postmortems together to understand what the manipulation looks like, what they were able to achieve, and what would have been at risk to the business is an incredibly useful exercise for getting ahead of these threats. All right, Brent, we have a related question I wanna send your way. Um, one of our participants says, API sound like a spider web built on a spider web and so on. Therefore, what analytics, if any, exist to identify all the webs in place? And then how do you address conflicts that may arise between the APIs? So how does one sort out what APIs are doing what? Because, you know, to Scott's earlier point, you can't secure what you can't observe. Well, I mean, I, I do think it kind of, it does start with, you know, especially for open APIs, if you've got, open APIs and you can fully describe them and you understand how the APIs are being utilized, what are the common methods and parameters, that's a great start. But I think, you know, what we're seeing in the industry is kind of table stakes for most of the solutions are you're going to need some level of an API catalog and, a, and an, a, an API understanding of how these um, APIs and endpoints interact with the various uh, clients and subscribers of those APIs. So getting visibility to understand, you know, especially as it relates to what the normal behaviors look like for the APIs, how often are they called, you know, what are the, the what are the standard methods and, and parameters that are being utilized for each of those? Because I think that's one of the easiest ways to kind of find the discovery in some of the, you know, early stages of the attack is just to look at how individual um, users or clients are interacting with those APIs. And are the patterns that you're seeing, are you seeing a certain number of failures? Are you certain, seeing a certain you know, number of maybe additional parameters being uh, added to it? Or maybe they're looking and you know, testing for certain kind of authentication or, or authorization type things. I mean, they, they seem fairly inconsequential. And as I said before, what we see is they're just going a lot slower and they're spreading it out across a larger number of IPs, but they're still performing a lot of the same basic behaviors. So getting a full catalog where you understand the APIs, the endpoints, what their standard utilization looks like, and then having that traceability in terms of, you know, how these APIs are interacting with the clients and the subscribers gives you a, a big, you know, leg up in terms of identifying when you're seeing some sort of abnormal behavior. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily, you know, bad yet, but it certainly is an indicator for you to be able to take a look and say, what else are these folks doing? And are we seeing other patterns of behavior that we can use as 
additional context to help us better understand who is truly a suspicious uh, user versus who's really a malicious user and bent for no good as we go through this. So I think, you know, you've got to have that level of visibility at a minimum, and then you have to have the baselines. You have to be able to build the baselines and while it changes daily, you've got to have the baselines for how these APIs operate and then the ability to kind of show how it's changing over time to be able to compare and contrast that information. And I would go one step further and say, you not only need all that information, but you need to make it visual. So for instance, in our platform, we've we've always had discovery. We've always had really rich parameter detail for, for every API, but very recently we introduced API call sequencing as like a visual map. And I'll be honest with you, I, I was looking at the guys, I'm like, okay, it's, it's cool, but who's gonna care? And like, I got attacked internally. Like, what are you thinking? Like, people don't know this. They don't know what this looks like. They don't know what the usage is. They write these APIs and then they have no idea how they're exercised. This is so important. And it has been really eye-opening. Like the guys can do, you know, as they're doing just even in an eval process, they can show people the mapping and like the visual trees of how things go. And there's always like, oh, I didn't realize it was being exercised that way. I didn't realize it was being used that way. I could actually optimize this thing. So it, it has ramifications and benefits to the org well beyond security too, which is really useful. Touching back more on some of the aspects that Scott was talking about in terms of developers really understanding how their stuff's being used. All right. Scott, we have another question from the audience. It yep. comes under the heading of coaching. So um, our question is, is if the developers are building for yes and the security team is building for no, as a member of the ops team, how do you stay out of the middle? Or as they used to say, I think it's an old saying in Africa, but you know, when the elephants fight, the mice get killed. So how do you avoid not being sure. the mice? Yeah, first of all, uh, developers building for yes, security building for yes and, not no, yes and. Uh, be a good improv member as a security team member. If you're, you know, as an operations member of a DevOps infrastructure or DevOps world, you're there trying to build infrastructure to make things go faster. That's your whole job. You're trying to build infrastructure and process and tooling to be able to help developers get uh, code from static code to compiled to deployed to running to operating and maintaining and monitoring that. That's your job is to make that pipeline go fast. You can talk with the security team about things that should be involved in that pipeline as well as the development team about what parts do they not know that the security team wants to know and integrate that in there and be a really great partner to both sides so that you don't get stomped. But Everyone, both teams have different priorities. Remember, don't forget the development team is, has a priority of getting features out there to generate revenue. The security team should as well, but the security team is more about protecting revenue, protecting churn, protecting reputation. So those teams are actually doing the same thing with different skew and different tilt on what they're doing. As an ops person, you can be a good partner to both of those to kind of bridge those, bridge those worlds because your job already got bridged, right? There used to be a separate operations department. Now it's more integrated. Help the security team think that way. They'll be very thankful. And so will your dev team. All right. We can all hope for the best. Hey, Michelle, we mentioned that there are a lot more APIs than ever, but it also seems like there's more types of APIs. There's GraphQL has emerged. There's a lot of other types of things besides REST. So are we prepared for all these new types of APIs and might things get worse before they get better? I think GraphQL is a great example of complicating security for sure. So mm -hmm. you can understand the appeal on the dev side. It's an, an elegant way to, you know, maybe you won't come back and ask me for more stuff if I give you a lot at once and then you can parse it on the front end and I'll just, you know, I'll just, I can add more queries right into one API and it sort of simplifies things. Um, so understand the appeal um, on the dev side for sure. What security needs to be aware of is that within a construct like GraphQL, within that framework, the ability to have nested queries, it makes security harder. You can lose track of things like authentication and authorization a little 
more easily in that kind of construct. And that's the hard part to, you know, they're harder to parse and therefore they're harder to keep track of like, has every step been met that this response should go back to this, um, to this person who made the query. So understanding the, the query structure inherent in that and how, um, how it gets more steps removed from security because it's not just a one for one call response, call response, call response, where it's really clearly laid out. Um, it just takes more investigation. When we needed to develop our platform to be able to understand GraphQL queries and to be able to do what we do, which is to understand the context really deeply over a long period of time, it was really hard. There was a significant amount of retooling that we had to do to support GraphQL effectively, to do it the way we did REST. So um, everybody's going to have to go through that learning curve to some extent to really understand what's going on with these queries. All right. Brent, where does the funding come from for API security? And I'm asking the question because um, security people will fund things that they control. And so they put their mud and money into security operations and firewalls and things like that. And they assume that the developers somehow or other are taking care of the other side of that. And the developers are assuming that the security people are taking care of that. And the end result is nobody funds anything and nothing happens. So um, where do we find the budget for API security? Well, I've been on both sides of the fence, for both on the uh, corporate side and on the vendor side. And in either place, I've, I've started to realize there is no magic money tree. And therefore, typically the money that is available is what's available. So, I mean, from my perspective, I think, you know, things like this, where we're doing some evangelism ar around the overall risk that really is out there as it relates to the API security um, is super important because the reality is, I think, you know, some of the funding for API security is going to come out of the budgets, um, first and foremost, the security budget as a whole. And there are, you know, certain things that uh, may be forecasted for budget for the next year that are going to have to be reevaluated from a prioritization perspective. And then I do think, you know, as you look at the application budgets and outside of security, there are other areas that you can, you know, uh, secure some level of funding. But the reality is, unless you're able to articulate the business value uh, from, a, from a budgeting perspective and, and why this is important, why it's something that can have the kind of impact that it can have. It's going to be very difficult to, you know, create a whole new spending category just for API security. So I, you know, from my perspective, I think, you know, there's enough going on, there's enough breaches that have happened recently. And then I think with kind of, you know, the, the noise in the market combined with some of the tactical information and practical information that we're able to provide from these solutions, you're starting to see the level of risk that does exist here. So. Yeah, we've seen two two primary paths, Mike. We've seen rolling it into a project. So, um, for instance, for a few of the banks that that we work with, they might have a new mobile app, um, and they start there, right? They're not trying to do everything for API security, but they're starting there, and so they'll fold, you know, some security within that project budget. So it could be an app, a mobile development project. It could be a digitalization project. We've even seen where this has been rolled into some um, portions of cloud projects where you still have people doing some amount of cloud um, cloud migration. So I think project-based is, is a key one. The second one is, and this is I think what Brett was really alluding to, there's usually about 20 to 30% of security budgets reserved as like slush fund. There's gonna be some oh shit moment and we just don't know what it is yet. And so we need some, some money set aside. And um, whether they've had their own breach or whether they were suspecting that this would be a big deal. And then through an evaluation process, they discover that they have some, some reasonable gaps on this front. They can tap that, that kind of that slush fund. Um, we are hearing more and more people saying it's a dedicated item in 2023 budget. Um, but I think early days, it usually happens this way, slush fund or project fund. All right, so everybody should work for a company that has a slush fund, and that's the first order of business. They're not very big. <laughs> All right, let's go around the horn here. Um, Scott, based on everything you heard so far and what we've talked, what's your best advice to folks about how to go to approach this? How should they get started? Where, where, where does the journey begin to get them down this path? Boy, the best advice? How about my advice? Uh, has always been to my... Security teams and application security teams, go sit with devs. 
Go understand what projects they're working on, what they're trying to solve for the business to generate revenue. That w- that takes you a long way into what's out there. What are we trying to do and what do I need to worry about? Uh, and then the second one is yes and. Not no. Yes and. There you go. Michelle, you've got a lot of customers in this space. So what have you seen them do successfully versus the ones that may have had a harder time? I think there's two main things. The, the first is to understand the difference between what and how. So in API security, I think there's widespread agreement that you need discovery. You need to know what the hell is out there. You need runtime and you need shift left. There's no question that you need all three. Um, so it's not the what that distinguishes the solutions, it's the how. And so that takes getting that level deeper and that takes testing. Because if you want to understand the how, then you've got to understand what happens when, you know, what are they going to discover in my environment? What can they discover in terms of hacking my environment? If I go to run tests, how realistic are these tests? I think things like understanding a a double parameter bola versus a single parameter bola, and then understanding how you would propagate a single parameter bola attack and what systems are able to find them and not find them. If you have a very contrived test that doesn't map to real world, that's all executed in like two minutes, it's not how API attacks are happening. And so, you know, you got to peel back the layers, you got to get to reality, you got to understand the how, and then you have to exercise these systems in a way that really mimics what the bad guys are doing out there, not some demo based lab based attack. That's not reflecting real world. All right, Brett, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I just, um, I think you get to know what you don't know. And I think it kind of fits into what's, what's just been said by the other panelists um, to do a proof of concept in this area. The one good thing about it is it's very easy. It's very fast. And so, you know, being able to, you know, deploy a, 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 any solution really, but get that visibility to the actual APIs and the endpoints and get a good feel for what is really out there and what type of traffic are you actually seeing? And, you know, start building the business case, you know, to secure the funding that we talked about based on real empirical information that really shows what you've got, because it's a big problem and it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me that, you know, as we go into these customers, as Michelle said, if it's a, you know, if it's a air gapped contrived environment, then you're going to see what you see. But if you're able to, to, you know, pick maybe a low risk uh, set of applications and really see the amount of traffic and the amount of attacks that are really going on, it almost instantly builds the business case for you to be able to go back and have that discussion around, look at the kind of things that are being, you know, thrown at us, look at what's being targeted, look at the potential risk that you have. And having that factual information really helps you as you, as you, you know, start to push the prioritization around these projects. All right. Well, folks, thanks for sharing your insights. Once again, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. So hopefully uh, people will pay more attention to API security. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Cody, who's got some closing housekeeping stuff for us. Cody, take it away. All right, Mike, thank you so much. And Michelle, Scott, Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, So I'd like to quickly remind everyone that this session was recorded. So following this panel, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand, or you can find the recording living on the Security Boulevard website at securityboulevard.com slash webinars, and just be sure to look in the on demand section. So on to the four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing. Our first winner is Amanda H. Our second winner is Rudford H. Our third winner is Eric L. And our fourth and final winner is Leah Z. So to our four winners, congratulations. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim your gift card. But if you do not see that email, just check your spam folder. And I've also got a quick plug right here. Let me go ahead and get it on the screen for you. So do you know what APIs you have and how secure they are? We'll learn how to set up an API security practice in your organization. With more and more applications containing many third-party components and open source code, software supply chains and APIs have become the new attack surfaces of choice. Everyone from the White House to entry-level developers talking SBOMs, open source security, and APIs, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention and you will not want to miss out. It's on Tuesday, September 13th, starting at 10 a.m. 
So to our panel, thank you once more for joining us and to our audience. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us as well. We have a brief survey that will pop up on the screen here in just a moment, but otherwise we hope to see everyone at a Tech Strong Learning program. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye.